Hi, I'm Dave, and welcome to my video. Thanks for checking it out. We're going to be covering some uh, basic hand techniques today, uh, some basic exercises to give you some strength and speed, and we're going to go into some slap studies uh, so you can develop some funk bass lines on your own, and then we're going to deal with some improvisational ideas, dealing with the modes and sequences uh, derived from the modes. Before we get started, though, let's uh, tune up our instruments. First, we'll do the uh, high G string. Next is D. The A string. And E. One more time, just check that out. G. All right, let's get to it. Okay, in this segment, I'd like to discuss uh, some basic techniques for the left and right hand and uh, show you some exercises that'll help you uh, build some strength in your hands and acquire some facility on the instrument. Let's start with some basic hand positions uh, in the left hand, for instance. Uh, you want to keep your thumb halfway behind the neck not put too much pressure on it. It's basically just a balancing tool and it needs to have a lot of freedom of movement. Um, and then across from that, your thumb can lie, okay, even with that. Your uh, left hand should be arched. Try to play on your fingertips. And basically you're going to cover one finger per fret. That's one position. Okay. Now try not to bring your thumb up or to bring the palm of your hand up either. You always want to keep space in here so that you can keep those fingers arched and play on your fingertips. Uh, most of these exercises that I'm going to show you were designed to be played with alternate picking in the right hand. So uh, before you start playing these left hand things, you can just practice the alternate picking by keeping the strings muted with your left hand and practice different groups with your right hand. Groups of four notes per string, three notes per string, and two notes per string, and any combination thereof, just so you're familiar with whatever combination you run into, but keep those fingers alternating. Okay, now let's move on to some warm-ups and some strength building exercises that I like to do. Uh, the first one I'd like to show you is called the spider exercise. This was shown to me a long time ago by one of my teachers. It's a great warm-up thing, gets your hands really going, all the digits of your hand. Uh, it's pretty simple. We're going to start with our first finger on low F. And we're going to play up chromatically, one finger per fret. Okay. Then we're going to move to the A string, and we're going to move up another fret. So we'll start on uh, second fret B, and play the same thing, etc. Third fret on the D string, fourth fret on the G string. Then keep moving up, fifth fret on the D string. want to end up on high G sharp, the 13th fret of the G string. Make sure you're alternating. Okay, then we'll go backwards from there using our fourth finger as our guide, and we'll go back four, three, two, one, going down one fret and one string at a time. You want to end up back on low F. If you don't, you missed a move somewhere. Okay, let me play that uh, in context with my friendly drum machine here. This is 16th notes. 
against an eighth note pulse. Okay, great. Now, one other thing I'd like to point out that you can do with this exercise is pretty interesting, is we can start uh, getting into some odd phrasings. Before we actually approach uh, the harmonic and melodic aspects of it, we can start feeling some different kinds of phrases using these exercises. Now, what I like to do here is play a four-note finger grouping as triplets, okay? So, the accents are going to change every beat, and it feels kind of weird, but it'll start you hearing some polyrhythmic phrases. So, let me start with eighth note triplets first and play a little bit of what that's going to sound like for you. Can get really interesting if you take it into 16th note triplets. Now I'd like to uh, just give you a couple strength building exercises for each digit of the left hand. Uh, first we'll start with some two finger groupings that will really help strengthen especially the third finger which is our weakest finger. Uh, we need to work on this one the most, so uh, this, this exercise will help you strengthen that. Again, be uh, careful to always play on your fingertips with this. Make your third finger work. Simple exercise, you can play it in any area of the neck. It just goes like this. We'll just play three, four, three, four, three, pretty simple, but it really lets you be conscious of what your third finger is doing. Then we can uh, work it even further, play two, three. Same concept. Etc. One, three. Then we'll go to one, four. And two, four. Etc. Now, played in context, I like to run these straight through and just get my hands really working here. So let's see if we can do that. Play 16th notes against this. metronome markings up on that, that'll really give your left hand a workout. Just be careful, don't strain the muscles in here. It can get tiring. All right, we can also play some four finger combinations. Obviously, there's a lot of different ones. You can use any combination of four fingers to get a, a different exercise. I'll just take one, three, two, four, again, starting on the first fret on the E string. Move up to the A string. Now, once I've played it on all the strings, I move up a fret. Play it on all the strings in the opposite direction. Okay, great. That can be really tough when you get into some, some of the uh, more complicated ones with the third finger and again when you start pushing the metronome markings up. Now, just one more quick thing you can do with that is let's try to get the right hand involved and get into a little cross picking. You can take one, three, two, four, but play it as double stops. Let's look at it as fifths, and we'll start on the low F, but we'll skip the third finger to the A string, and the second finger back to the E string, fourth finger on the A string, and then we'll move it just like the uh, previous one. Etc. And you can take that even further too and uh, do three, uh, three string combinations, play octaves, if you really want to get crazy with it. All right, now that you've uh, acquired some strength, some dexterity on the instrument, 
Uh, let's cover one other aspect of bass playing you're going to need to deal with, and that's developing a reach or opening up your hands. Uh, these are some stretching exercises that I think will help you do that. Uh, as a bass player, we're going to need to cover one more fret than a normal position comfortably, and that can be quite difficult because of the scale of the bass. In other words, our normal position will be first finger to fourth finger is four frets. We need to be able to comfortably play first finger to fourth finger five frets. Okay. Now I think these exercises may help you start developing that reach. This also becomes important when, if you start playing really involved voicings or anything like that. Again, we'll start on low F. And we'll, the main thing here is to keep our first finger planted in the first fret because we want to go for maximum stretch. Okay, then let's go as far as we can to the fifth fret, keeping our first finger in the first fret. And then just work it across that first fret. Here we don't want to move up because we, this is where the maximum distance is. Now, that may be a little tough at first, so you might want to start a little higher on the neck, let's say A to C sharp. Now, as you get comfortable with that, Again, start moving it down the neck until you can comfortably play a major third from first fret F. Okay, and that's one to four. Then we want to stretch one to three and get a four fret reach. And then, of course, one to two. All right. Now, one other thing you can do with this is three finger combinations. These really start working your hand also. Um, first one we'll do would be one, three, four. The third finger stretching to the fourth fret, and then the fourth finger to the fifth fret. And then you'll move that the same way. One, three, four. Okay. Then one, two, and three. All right, great. Uh, one other thing about stretching, uh, these things can be painful at times, so uh, don't overdo it. You can really hurt your hands by uh, playing these too much or you know, too often. If you start to feel pain, stop playing. You're just going to be damaging things. So stop playing, shake your hand out, and relax for a few minutes. One thing I found that really helps me loosen up is to go back to the spider exercise. And that really loosens my hand up and makes it feel a whole lot better. All right, now, now you've got a, a whole repertoire of exercises that are strictly non-musical. They're just gymnastics, they're just for conditioning. And that's okay, but uh, don't lose sight of the priorities. The most important thing is to develop a good musical sense. These are just conditioning exercises. And if you get too caught up in them, You'll lose a lot of time you should be spending on learning how to play music. Now, while we're still in the exercise segment, let me show you one exercise that's going to start you thinking more musically, but still uh, use a lot of the techniques we've just talked about. It'll, it'll help you work on stretching and some various other finger techniques. Now, what we're going to do is two octave arpeggios, okay, major to minor, alternating up the neck. Let's start with a two octave F major arpeggio. Again. First finger on the E string, first fret. Then that's going to go to fourth finger. Then one on C. F. Stretch your fourth finger up. One. Now here's where you have to be conscious of your top note at all times. You have to be looking ahead for that top octave. That's a big jump. Perfect fourth on the G string. And then back down. Let's make it even a little more complicated and use an alternate fingering, one that sounds better and feels a little better for descending. So now you'll have to think of two things for each arpeggio. We'll come down four, one, three on the D string, A note, four on F. So we're rolling across here. Stretch down to C, and fourth finger, and first. So that looks like this in its entirety. Now, after we play that, in successive eighth notes, what we want to do is move up to F sharp and play a minor arpeggio. This is a Jocko exercise, by the way. And we'll do the same, same concept. One, four, one, four. Again, see your high octave. 
and then come back down with the rolling motion. Okay, that's F sharp minor in two octaves with two different fingerings. Now, what I like to do with this, again, to get into some weird phrasing, is play eighth notes nonstop. So the root note of each new arpeggio will not always be on the downbeat. That'll sound like this. Let me play it with the drum machine. Okay? That's alternating major and minor arpeggios up and down the neck. Okay, this next segment is going to deal with slap style playing. Uh, I'll try to give you a few different exercises and ideas you can use to develop some uh, funk lines on your own. Again, I want to start with some basics of this style. It can be a little frustrating if you haven't done it before. So let me give you a few pointers just to get you rolling, and then we'll get into some more uh, complicated ideas. OK. Now, the hardest thing at first is to just produce a good, consistent sound, um, with your thumb especially. So let's just try playing a C note on the A string and work with our thumb, see if we can get that note to sound consistently. Now, what you want to do is strike the string with the bone of your thumb, the hard part there, and play up towards the fingerboard so that you're actually hitting on the frets. And another thing you want to consider is that it's all in the wrist. Don't try to pick with your thumb. Use your wrist to slap. It's actually slap style. Now, the next aspect of that is we're going to start popping with the first finger, or if you're more comfortable, the second finger of your right hand. I use my first finger. Um, we can start playing even eighth notes, just trying to get. Now, what we should do is move that idea down to the E string. Uh, a lot of this style playing is done with octaves, so you're going to be playing in two string groups, the A and the G string which presents a problem of getting in on the A string without hitting the E string. But the G is free and clear. Then the E and D string, the E string is free and clear, but you have to get your first finger in under the G string. So the exercises I'm going to show you practice both ways, on the A and G string and the E and D string. Now, let's, uh, let's just try some simple 16th notes uh, on the A string, and then we'll move it to the uh, E string with the drum machine here. Okay, once you're pretty comfortable with that and you're getting a good sound all the time from your thumb, you can start moving around a little bit. Now, let's take that idea and put it into a simple pattern that we can use for the rest of these exercises. We'll just play C first. Then we'll go to E flat, D, D flat. Then play that on the E string. Okay, that should make it a little more interesting when you're practicing. Now, let's go on to another variation. Uh, this is a very uh, percussion oriented style of playing. So uh, we need to get familiar with a lot of different combinations between the thumb and the first finger. Uh, much like a drummer does different left and right hand combinations called paradiddles and stuff like that, uh, we need to be versatile with any grouping we may run into. Now let's just start with two strokes of the thumb and then a, a pop. <laughs> now let's put that up to tempo. Okay, that's one alternative. Now let's put the pop in the middle. Okay, and we can put that up to tempo. Great, now let's play two pops on top. 
play a thumb and then two pop notes in the rhythm of okay, next technique I'd like to show you uh, is called ghost notes or muted notes simple idea just mute the notes with the left hand. In other words, we're not going to play a pitch in this hand, and we're going to strike normally with the right hand. Uh, you just want to avoid getting any tones on the left hand. And you want to be very careful not to play over harmonics so that you, they start sounding. Strictly percussive. Now, let's try an idea using regular notes and ghost notes together. We'll play thumb pop, uh, with the C and a C octave, and then we'll mute the next two sixteenth notes. So it will sound like. Okay, now from there we can move on to hammer ons. This is a technique you'll find used quite a bit in uh, all aspects of this playing. Uh, and again, here we can use it two ways. We can either hammer on with a pop note or using our thumb. Now let me show you a little idea. Uh, using a hammer-on with a pop note. We'll start with just a B flat to a C. I'm thinking in C minor or C7 here, so the seventh to the root. And then we'll play two thumb notes. Now let me show you a lick you can use uh, that'll incorporate both hammer-ons and some ghost notes. We're going to start with that same hammer-on from the B flat. Then we're going to go to two ghost notes with our thumb, and then hammer-on from F to G, then, and two more ghost notes with the thumb. Go down to the first fret on the D string, E flat, hammer-on from E flat to F, first to third fret. Do one ghost note with a thumb, and then grab the B flat and slide to C. So B. All right, that can be a cool fill if you're playing a regular kind of groove thing. So I'll try to throw it into that context. Let's move on to uh, hammer-on using the thumb. We'll start with an open A note and hammer-on our first finger C there. Then let's play another C with a thumb and then grab the octave. So we have four sixteenth notes that sound like this. Now, when you start using some tricks like these, you can really start developing some speed with these exercises. Uh, let me show you what that sounds like in context. Okay, you can also use this technique for this little triplet fill that I do. Uh, this is pretty impressive sometimes. Uh, we'll do the same basic idea. Thumb, hammer, thumb. And then we're just going to do some regular plucking up top. And if you get it fast, you can start sounding like. Let's try to put all these things together and, uh, into a little line we can use and you can groove on and practice at home, practice with a drum machine, practice with your band, whatever. Uh, it's a lick that I've liked to play and a lot of my students seem to enjoy, so I'll show it to you. Um, it sounds like this, and then I'll go through it slowly and show you step by step. 
Okay? Now, we're going to start with a low E with a thumb. And we're going to pop a C sharp, which is the sixth fret on the G string. Pop the next fret, D. Okay, then there's a rest and a third pop in a row, which will be an interesting coordination exercise for you. And we're going to mute these next three notes. Pop, thumb, pop. Which will set us up for our thumb on the C sharp octave, D octave. Second measure starts off the same as the first. Then we're going to add some fills on the bottom end. Uh, thumb, hammer on, fifth fret to seventh fret on the E string, A to B. Thumb, hammer on, fifth to seventh fret on the A string. Then play a G, fifth fret on the D string. E, seventh fret on the A string. So let's hear what that sounds like. The last thing I'd like to talk about in terms of slap style playing is a technique called left hand muting. We're going to start using our left hand to generate some percussive notes uh, as we have done so far with the right hand. We're just going to use the left hand to slap the bass like that. Uh, so let me show you some exercises that could get you comfortable with that technique. Uh, the first one, we'll just play an open thumb note, then we'll slap the bass with our left hand, thumb again with a muted note, so you'll keep your left hand down and then a fourth note, thumb open. So that's four sixteenth notes. All right, now let's bring the, some pop notes into this technique. Uh, we'll use that on the third partial of the sixteenth note phrase. We'll do open thumb note, slap the bass with the left hand, pop, thumb, muted. So we got Lastly, let's try to put the pop note fourth, and we'll play an actual note. We'll play a note, uh, D on the seventh fret of the G string. Okay, so we'll have thumb, slap with the left hand, mute, pop the D. Okay, now this, is, this can be really cool if you walk the first finger up and down the G string. You can start getting some melodic lines kind of happening in there. So you can experiment with that and see where it leads you. I'd like to close out this part with another lick you can learn and, and play with. Um, I'd like to make one more point. It's, this one is an E. Uh, like so many of them are. But you should try to translate most of these techniques to closed position keys like G and B flat. Uh, a lot of guys have a lot of chops in the open string keys and they get to G or B flat or D flat and they're out to lunch. So all this can apply if you practice it. It's a little more difficult but it can be done. So work with it and see what you can come up with and you'll be a lot better off on a record date or something as far as coming up with a creative bass line. All right. Now, let me show you this last lick. We're just going to start with two thumb notes, and then a slap note with the left hand, and pop. Then we're going to play a C sharp with our thumb and slide up to D. Now, let's do that again and add a ghost note with a thumb after the D. And then and that'll conclude the first measure. We're going to hammer on from high D on the G string to E. Pop note. So the first measure sounds like... Okay, now the second measure is, starts the same as the first. Then we're going to throw in our favorite pentatonic lick. Hammer on from the fifth fret on the E string to the seventh fret. Fifth fret A string. 
So that'd be. Second measure sounds like. Okay. Third measure will be the same as the first. And then we'll throw in another cool little lick at the end there. Okay, that's the whole lick. Let's jump into the area of soloing and uh, developing some solo concepts. And uh, maybe I can give you some ideas about what you can do if you're ever stuck in a rut and you want to get some fresh ideas happening. Um, first, let's talk about the modes. Uh, I don't know how many of you know what the modes are, but uh, let me familiarize you with them briefly. Uh, the modes are the chord scales that we use to improvise, and they're derived from each tone of the major scale. So there's seven tones in the major scale, consequently there's seven modes. Uh, if we're playing a C major scale, that's the C uh, Ionian mode, that arrangement of notes. Same as the C major scale, okay? Now if you took that same arrangement of notes, no sharps or flats, and started on D, you'd have the D Dorian mode. If you looked at the first, third, and fifth, and seventh tone of the, of the Dorian mode, you'd find that you had a minor seventh chord. So this particular mode is used to improvise over minor seventh chords. Now you'll find that there's more minor seventh chords with, within each key, so you start to, uh, you have to learn about chord relationships to really determine what key you're in and what mode you need to improvise. Let me show you a system I have for learning all the modes as easily as possible in all the keys. We're going to start them all on the E string with our first finger. Uh, let's start in the key of F in this instance. And here we'll just play a major scale and we'll extend it up to a fifth above the octave. Okay, then we'd move to the next tone of the F major scale, which is G, and we can play the Dorian mode. Now, with all these modes, there's basically only going to be three fingering combinations. So don't get uh, too bent out of shape about it. We're either going to play two whole steps, one, two, four, or a whole step and a half step, one, three, four, or a half step and a whole step, one, two, four. So as you're learning these modes, apply that to it, and you'll be pretty right on as far as fingering is concerned. Now, another thing is, in each key, there's only seven fingerings. So once you learn the shapes, you can transpose them to any other key. So there's really only seven shapes to learn, and you're there. So let's continue on through the modes in F, the uh, A uh, Phrygian mode. Okay, B flat Lydian. It's a lot like a major scale with a raised fourth. C Mixolydian, which you play over dominant chords, you'll find that this has a major third with a flatted seventh. like a major scale also with that flat at seventh in it. D Aeolian. And then E Locrian. Now you don't get a lot of call to play a Locrian mode because the, the chord that that's built off is a minor seven flat five chord. But one thing you might want to think about is considering it as starting the C Mixolydian mode on the third. Okay, so you can start applying these substitutions as you get more involved with this stuff. Some of this material may, may take a little research, so just dig in and it'll start to make sense to you. Now, the next thing you want to do, or what I would like to do, is, is play these through all the keys. So I use the cycle of fourths. Our next key would be B flat. And we want to start with the lowest note on the E string, the one that's closest to the nut, and play the mode from there. Now in B flat, the lowest note would be F. So we have to figure out which tone of the B flat scale F is. It's what? 
the fifth. Right, so it's going to take the Mixolydian mode. So we'll start B flat in Mixolydian. Aeolian. Etc. Now, just uh, to give you an example, let's try a, a couple sharp keys like A would start where? Right, F sharp Aeolian. Etc. Etc. Okay, now let me show you a couple exercises I do with these to get familiar with them and go through the keys. Uh, first thing we can do is just play straight 16th notes up and down and keep moving the modes up the neck. Let me play with the, the drum machine here. in the key of F. If you can take this through all the keys, you'll really start to get a good understanding of keys and key relationships, chords, and their chord scales, and you'll really start to know the fretboard really well. So it might be something you want to spend some time with. Now, let me show you another exercise we can do with that. Uh, getting back to the phrasing I talked about when we did the spider exercise, let's put this into 16th note triplets. And to make it even a little more difficult, let's go up one mode in triplets. <laughs> Shift with our fourth finger and go down the next mode. Then shift up with our first finger, etc. Let's see what that sounds like. Before we go on to developing some lines uh, and licks using those modes, let me just touch on arpeggios briefly. You can apply the same kind of system to those, and it uh, will provide you with some vertical movement, which is really interesting on the bass, because most bass players play ve very much from a scale perspective. So if you can start working some arpeggios into your playing, it'll sound great. Uh, and let me just give you an example of, for instance, G major 7 with that same approach, playing all the inversions starting with the one closest to the nut. Now, the uh, note in G major 7th that's closest to the nut is F sharp, the 7th. So we've got to figure out the four shapes for this chord. We'll start with the 7th. Okay, then we'd move up to root position, starting on the G. From the 3rd. And the 5th. Now that's the four inversions of a G major 7th. Now let's run those together, see what it sounds like. Now if you can start putting those together and then do the dominant chords and the minor seventh chords and minor seventh flat five chords, you'll have a real good understanding of harmony and a real good understanding of the fretboard. You really have to see where you're going with these kinds of things, so it's a good exercise. Okay. Now let's move on to some soloing concepts. We'll go back to the modes for that. But just remember, this all applies to arpeggios as well. Okay. Now, you're stuck for a lick and you're saying, well, playing a scale is really boring. And you know, that doesn't really make it. You, you need a little variety. So let's take a real simplistic approach and figure out what we can do to get some variety happen. Well, the first thing I'd say do is let's play four note scale groupings. We'll play up four notes of the scale. I'm in C major now. Okay. Then we'll go back to the second note of the scale, D, and play a four note group from there. Okay. Etc. Okay. Now instead of having a straight scale, we have a lick that sounds like. Now you can reverse that lick on the way back and do the same thing. Say we're starting on the fifth of C. You can just come down in groups of four. Okay. Let's see 
what that sounds like in context. <laughs> Okay, now that's one idea to get you started playing some licks, but you go, well, that's not that hip. You know, it's still pretty straight ahead. You can really hear the scale. So what can we do to change it up? Well, let's do something with it rhythmically. Let's displace it by one sixteenth note. You can take that exact pattern, and by starting it on the uh of beat four, you can get a much cooler sound than just playing it on the downbeats. So let's hear what that sounds like. Two, three, four. All right, so now you can go anywhere with that idea. You can start on the uh, E of one, displace it one sixteenth note the other way. Two, three, four. Okay, we can take this concept even farther out and start uh, introducing some polyrhythmic ideas like I, I discussed earlier. Um, and we can take these four note groups and play them as 16th note triplets, where the accent will be changing every beat. And it's going to be the exact same pattern, but it's going to feel weird rhythmically. So you should work with it slowly at first. Let me play it as 8th note triplets first, and then 16th note triplets. And then you can play it down too. Now, 16th note triplets, it starts to get pretty hip. Okay, now that's a lot of material right there. Remember, apply it to the arpeggios and all the different modes, and you'll have a wealth of solo material. As you continue experimenting with uh, melodic ideas, just bear in mind, you can do any combination of, of notes. You can go up in groups of four, and then down four, and then all the other stuff applies to that, too. Or start down four, and again, the rhythmic variations apply, the 16th note triplets apply. So just from those three patterns, we've got about 40 licks to deal with. Now, if you really want to get strange, you can get into some of the things like Jocko did. Uh, his phrasing was based on five note groupings, but as regular 16th notes. So here's the next step we can go to. Instead of just four note groupings, we'll take it to five note groupings. So he would take a 16th note pattern. He would play regular 16th notes, but phrased in groups of five. So he'd start the scale going down. <laughs> broken all into groups of five, but the pulse is just in four notes. One, two, three, four. Okay, you can also extend this idea to six notes, and this works really well with the pentatonic scale, which is a five-note scale, but if you add the low octave onto it, or the starting note, you can make it a six-note pattern. Let's take the E pentatonic scale, starting on A, on the 14th fret of the G string. Play the E pentatonic, right down. E, excuse me, A, G, E, D, D, A. Now that same uh, configuration of notes will happen here. Starting on G, then on E, D, Now, if you play that straight down, it starts to become a pretty cool lick for descending. So now you've got four notes and five notes and six note groupings, which you can get a lot of material from to work with. I'd like to demonstrate some of the sequences and lines we've been talking about in a progression consisting of five chords. 
Uh, it's basically in C minor, which is relative to E flat major, so we can look to E flat for the modes to play over the chords. We start with a C minor seventh chord, and that'll take the Aeolian mode, because it's the sixth of E flat. And it moves to an A flat major chord with a sharp 11 or a flat 5, the A flat Lydian mode. You have that D note in there, which is still relative to E flat. Then it goes to F minor and B flat, which is a 2 5 in E flat, so you could play Dorian to Mixolydian there. And then a turnaround change, basically a G dominant chord, G7, which can be approached several ways. You can either play the Mixolydian mode based off of G from that, or a preferable approach is to borrow from the C harmonic minor and play a G altered mode. So if you have a C harmonic minor scale, that introduces that B that gives you the dominant sound. And we'll just bass that and make G our root note. And that resolves very nicely back to the C minor. So let's check that out. Well, that about wraps it up. I hope you got some stuff you can use from the video and uh, enough material to keep you working for a long time. Practice hard, and I look forward to hearing your next record. Thanks. Mm -hmm.